So I've been following the James Webb Space Telescope for a long time, long before I actually started this channel, but especially once I became a science YouTuber, it's kind of been part of my job. So uh, I wouldn't call myself an expert or anything just because I'm not an actual scientist, but to say that I've been waiting a long time for what I saw today would be an understatement. And yes, I'm recording this on Tuesday when the pictures were released. So I feel compelled to talk about what we've all seen this week, but I do encourage you to go watch videos from actual astrophysicists like Dr. Becky and Launchpad Astronomy and others. I'll put links to those videos down below. Um, they have the real expertise on all this. And oh, by the way, if they say anything that con uh, you know contradicts what I'm saying here, go with them by all means, please. But like. Anybody who's been following this for a long time knows what a big deal this is, and I imagine most of my audience has already seen these images, but let's just go ahead and take a look at them. So they made this announcement in a live presentation on NASA's YouTube channel, which was kind of hilariously um, uh, riddled with technical issues. But as somebody who does this for a living, I, I don't want to say that to make fun. I genuinely get how hard these things can be, uh, but I was laughing. I was laughing with them. That makes it okay, right? It was hosted by Michelle Fowler, who did her best under these conditions, but anyway, they started with this deep field image. So this first image that was released, it was actually kind of leaked on the 11th, um, kind of before everything else. Joe Biden actually is the one that, that put it out there. He had the, the honor of being the president, get to do that. Um, but this was the first deep field. So we all remember Hubble's deep field. First of all, there was the, the original deep field, then they did an ultra deep field. Well, one of the big things that they've always been saying about JWST was that it would be able to see further back into the universe than ever before. Um, a lot of these galaxies in Hubble were just very red. Um, but on JWST, they were able to pull it in sort of like, of course they colorize it, but because it's able to see in a, a near infrared capacity, it was able to see much further and much clearer on these things. And the first thing that brings, that, that, that comes to mind when you look at this is just the extreme resolution when you go in on this. I mean, you can, you can discern individual stars in these galaxies that are millions and millions of light years away. Probably like, I think 13.9 billion light years away is probably the oldest one that they see in here. Uh, 13.5, I believe. Um, and of course you're seeing all of these aberrations and these like weird um, <laughs> uh, curves in these galaxies. And there's some of these over here that get curved all the way around. This is of course because of gravitational lensing. There's a, there's a galaxy cluster right here in the middle and you can see everything kind of curving around it. And that's because of the extreme gravity that's being created right there in the middle because of that gravitational uh, uh, lensing in, the, in that galaxy cluster. Um, these up here, the, the, the stars with the big spikes coming out of them, the big snowflake kind of stars, um, a couple of things about that. First of all, as Neil deGrasse Tyson was saying, you can just ignore those. Those are actually stars that are in our own Milky Way. Those are like in front of all the galaxies behind it. Um, and so they flare out like that. And the reason they do them in six points is because all the mirrors on JWST are hexagonal. So you're gonna get six points out of them. So this is gonna be kind of a defining characteristic of JWST. It's not the first telescope that's had um, the hexagonal star shape to it, but um, it's gonna be a defining characteristic of these. So get used to it. But yeah, with its very first image, JWST, has taken the deepest image ever taken, deep, deepest photo ever taken into our universe. And like I said, these redder galaxies, these tiny red dot galaxies, are some of the very first galaxies that were ever formed. But they also did uh, spectra on some of these galaxies, especially that really old galaxy that I was talking about. And it shows that it was, uh, what is it, 13.9 billion years old. Yeah, you can see here, this is kind of tiny on your screen, sorry. But uh, yeah, this one galaxy that was right there in the middle, um, they were able to discern it's 13.1 billion years old. And with that spectral images, they were also able to do this, which is pretty cool. They were able to show that these two galaxies right here uh, are the same galaxy. These are mirror images of each other because they have the exact same spectra as, um, as each other. So those, those two galaxies are the same galaxy that's just stretched because of gravitational lensing or mirrored because of gravitational lensing. And, um, and that spectra is showing that there's high levels of oxygen and hydrogen in there. So um, yeah, basically what this is telling you is that the oxygen that you are breathing, that's how old it is. It was made in the very first galaxies ever created in the universe. It is, it is 13 billion years old, the oxygen that's keeping you alive right now. So yeah, I just want to point this out. Some people have done uh, animations like this that show, uh, this is Hubble's view of that exact same spot in space compared to JWST. And we'll, we'll go back to some comparisons again here in just a second, but I feel like um, that's one of the most important things that has been done in this whole looking through these pictures of JWST is people comparing them to Hubble's pictures because 
obviously everything has to have perspective. You gotta have the context to it. When you just see the images, it's like, okay, that's cool. But when you see how much better this is than the best space telescope we have ever created um, before that and the best images we've ever seen before that, it's astonishing. And that, that's, where, that's where you get the tinglies down your spine, or at least I do anyway. Okay, so the next thing you talked about was an exoplanet spectra, but before I really jump into what that is, it's, it's kind of interesting to point out that um, there's a lot of things they've been talking about that JWST could do for a long time. You know, I'm just going to start saying web, I think. I'm, I'm kind of stumbling over JWST. Web. But they've been talking about all these different things that web can do over the years, and uh, the, it, it's kind of funny because each of these pictures kind of displays that. It kind of tests these, these abilities <clears throat> that web was created for. So that first one was that, that, that deep field, that looking way, way into the past. That was kind of the thing that everybody was excited about for James Webb. But the other thing was being able to um, look at the composition of atmospheres and exoplanets. So that's what they did here. So this isn't necessarily an image, it's really more of a graph, but it's an important graph. It's really interesting. So there's a planet called WASP-96b. It is 11 times bigger than Earth and orbits closer to its star than Mercury. So it's a very, very hot planet. And what they were able to do was they were able to find signs of water vapor. Um, obviously water is something that they look for in signs of life, but it's not definitive. The planet's way too hot and the, the water is basically steam. So it's not likely that this planet actually has life on it. But it's, it's a miracle they're able to, to do this. Like the way they do it is basically through the transit method. I'm just gonna say this real quick, just for those that might not know. So the transit method is kind of how they found most of the exoplanets that are in the universe. It's basically a planet that you got the star and a planet passes in front of the star through our telescope. That light dims just ever so slightly. And so we know that there's a planet going around it because it happens in regular intervals and whatnot. Um, but what James Webb is able to do, <clears throat> what the Webb t telescope is able to do, is it's able to read the, just the sliver of atmosphere around that planet, it's able to read what wavelengths of light are being blocked as they pass through that wavelength, or as they pass through that sliver of atmosphere. And those wavelengths that are being blocked correspond to certain chemicals in the atmosphere, so they can figure out what the composition is. And uh, obviously they're looking for special things like water, they're looking for things like basically Earth-like planets, planets that have the same kind of composition that Earth does. So you would look for nitrogen, you'd look for oxygen, uh, methane, things like that. And, uh, and this one has the, the water, the, 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 well, H2O, so that's hydrogen and oxygen, obviously. So again, we're talking about certain wavelengths of light and how much is being blocked of those wavelengths. So you got the wavelengths down below, the amount of light here, and that corresponds to, uh, and you can see like where these like vertical lines are, those are the, those are the, um, the, the parts that are blocked there. Anyway, so these, these spikes here, they correspond with water, and so they found water. And this was done through the single object slitless spectroscopy, <laughs> or NIRIS. So yeah, all of these kind of correspond to different instruments that are on JDBST and kind of show off what they can do. But of course, we're visual people. We don't just want to look at charts. We want to look at cool space shiz, and the next one does not disappoint, not even a little bit. So this one is a bit of a jaw dropper. This was called the, uh, the Southern Ring. Um, it's this particular star that's a dying star and, um, and the reason why it has this sort of shell around it is because all these different layers of gas and dust that are around it, these are various episodes, they correspond to various episodes of this star throwing off its gas and its dust and whatnot. So, um, so yeah, the, the, the various layers kind of show that this has been happening for a long time, but the detail in this is absolutely stunning. And, and again, you're just, you're just capturing galaxies just in the background of these images. It's just so unbelievable. Um, but what's really cool about this is they use two different instruments. So I believe this one is the near cam, which is the near infrared, uh, which is kind of a, a lower wavelength of infrared, and then the, the MIRI camera, which is the mid infrared. And the difference here is that the, this one picks up more dust, so you see those big dust clouds and whatnot. This one kind of passes through the dust a little bit more, but what they were able to see here was that it's actually a binary star. So this tiny star right here on the, on the side, that's the one that exploded. That's the one that threw off all of this gas and dust and everything, and it's orbiting around, or they're orbiting around each other, uh, this other star here, so it's a binary system. And you couldn't really pick that up on this or any, I mean, you can kind of see it right there, but it's kind of hidden in the, in the lens flare. But um, yeah, this, this was the first time that that has been picked up. And so again, it's just kind of showing the power of the different instruments on, on web. But mostly it's just, yeah, this was, this was a jaw dropper. This is just such a beautiful image. Uh, somebody in my Discord group said that, uh, I guess they read on Twitter, somebody was like, we're gonna be seeing a lot of new posters out of these images. 
And I think that's completely true. And, uh, and especially, especially it's impressive when you look at, um, again, a comparison between this and Hubble, the Hubble's image that was taken of it. I'll get to that in the, in the end. It's, I'm, I'm, kinda, I'm kinda saving it for the end, but just hang on, we'll, we'll get there. It's, it's really impressive, it's really cool. The next one up is a, an image of galaxies. Um, this one's called Stefan's Quintet. So there's actually five galaxies here. So one, two, three, four, five. And um, this is interesting because these two galaxies right here are colliding, just like Milky Way and Andromeda are gonna do someday. So they're merging. So this gives a good look at how galaxies merge and how they form and how they evolve over time because galaxies are always colliding with each other. And this is such a high res image. Look when I punch in here, like you can barely even get these two in here. Um, the, the resolution on this is just insane. And again, all of this stuff in the background are galaxies. Look at that. Those are all galaxies. And, and, and again, these up here with the, the stars with the big shiny uh, the snowflake patterns. Those are those are close-up stars that are kind of in our own Milky Way. Um, but yeah, it's just absolutely, it's, it's just amazing. And you can see individual stars in these things. And again, they did this on a couple of different wavelengths. I believe this one was the near cam one. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this was the, the midi cam. So this is a, a mid infrared, so you can kind of see more detail down in here. But what they were actually able to do with this one was cool, was that you can see, um, a black hole. This big shiny bit right here, again, it's, it almost looks like just a regular star, but if you compare it to this one over here, it corresponds to this galaxy. So it's not just a star in the foreground, or you would see it here too. It's actually a black hole. And the reason why it's shining so high uh, in that infrared spectrum, that deep infrared spectrum, is because it's basically just heat coming out of, of the black hole. And um, somebody said, uh, I wanna say it was in my Discord chat, that somebody was saying that the, the plume coming out of this is going so fast that if it was going from the Earth to the moon, it would get there and back in less than an hour. Uh, for comparison, the Apollo guys, it took three days to get to the moon. And just like with the exoplanet, just like with that, uh, that old galaxy that I was looking at a second ago, they were able to look at the composition of gas around an active black hole. So again, you're looking at that black hole right up above there. It was the same one that I was pointing at, that right there. They were able to look at that and snap it out there, do a little spectroscopy, spectroposcopy, spectroposcopy, colonoscopy. They did a colonoscopy on the black hole. Oh God. <laughs> so the colonoscopy of the black hole produced iron, argon, neon, sulfur, neon, sulfur, neon, and oxygen and molecular hydrogen silicates. Anyway, so they were able to like pull out, um, you know, the spectroscopy of, uh, and this is again, near cam and MIRI imaging here. Um, but yeah, so again, just really cool image. They're pulling, because they're doing all these different layers of uh, wavelengths in the, in the galaxy, they were able to pull out all this stuff and it's, it's just, it's just mind blowing. But the piece de resistance, the one that is going to really put a whole lot of posters on college walls was the one of the Carina Nebula. They described this as an image of star birth um, because these are, these are sort of the nebulas where stars form. Again, like always, these big uh, star bursts are the close-up stars in our Milky Way galaxy. But, um, and I think actually this whole thing might be in the Milky Way galaxy because all of these stars have those, uh, have those bursts on them. But the detail in this image, guys, it's friggin' unreal. Like, this was the one that really made everybody's jaws drop. If you haven't seen Dr. Becky's reaction video when this thing came out, uh, I thought she was gonna pass out. <laughs> it was absolutely glorious. But um, this is just, I mean, look at this. It makes me wanna get a latte. It's just so beautiful. But yeah, this is a star forming region here in the Milky Way galaxy. This video, this picture, sorry, contains hundreds of stars we've never seen before. Structures that we don't even know what they are, I think in the, in the, in the uh, live stream she was pointing out like uh, one of these structures down here or this one, like they don't even know what it is. But yeah, just, just absolutely beautiful. It's just mind blowing, this image. By the way, if you hear my AC blowing, I normally would turn it off, but it's like 105 in Texas right now. So you're just gonna have to deal with it, sorry. But again, you really don't get a sense of how amazing and mind blowing these images are until you compare them to what Hubble did. And I wanna point out a guy, his name is John Ed Christensen, or at least that's the name of his website. He shared this on Reddit. Um, he actually created a tool that lets you compare the web uh, images versus the Hubble images. And 
let's just jump to that because it's pretty awesome. But yeah, so you got this JBST, there's Hubble. Webb, Hubble. The Southern Ring Nebula, again, let's see if I can get this to work. That's what Hubble took. That's what Webb took. Hubble, Webb. Stevens Quintet, again, actually it's Stefan's if I'm not mistaken, but Hubble, Webb. And of course this one is the is the real mind blower. And let me see if I can pop this a little bit bigger. So actually Hubble only took a small sliver of this whole thing. So so Webb's is like already just so much bigger, but you can kind of see right there that hump, that little peninsula, that protrusion, whatever, the difference in in quality. Like Webb's is like you can't even Hubble doesn't even pick up a lot of these stars in the image behind because it can't see through that dust cloud. Uh, and that's what they were saying. There's hundreds of stars here that they didn't even know existed. And and the, the difference in quality. And of course, just the, the size of the web, uh, you know, camera, the web sensor is able to pick up all that. So yeah, I'll put a link to that down in the, in the description. Um, I think those are all of them, but it's fun to just kind of play with. And there's also all kinds of other uh, links that I'll put down there as well. And of course, immediately, because the internet got an internet, the, 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 the web memes appeared. Here are some of my favorites. But I think the most important thing that we can take away from this, if I may wax philosophical for just a second, is that um, these images are just the beginning. Like, I think some people are looking at it and like, ooh, look what this big telescope did. No, these were test shots, <laughs> just to make sure it was working, testing out all the different instruments and stuff. And already we're seeing things we have never seen before. We're capturing details that were never possible before, just in these test shots. I mean, these test shots are putting Hubble's best images, most groundbreaking, mind-blowing images, they're putting that to shame and in a lot less time than Hubble was able to do. They actually mentioned in the presentation that um, that Hubble Ultra Deep Field image that we're all familiar with, which up until now was the furthest we've ever seen in the universe, that took, that took two weeks to capture. That was two weeks of pointing in the exact same spot in the sky in order to capture that image. This web deep field image that we saw first, the, the one that kind of leaked, the one that it just blows it out of the water. And as they said in the presentation, it was done before breakfast. In fact, all of these images that we're looking at were done over a span of five days. In five days, they were able to do all of this. So not only is Webb able to take much more clear, detailed pictures than Hubble ever was, it's able to do it a lot faster, like way faster. So yeah, combine that with the fact that ESA nailed the launch so perfectly and hit the orbit so perfectly uh, that they're not going to have to use as much fuel for it to maintain its orbit. This is going to give it up to 20 years of service, they're thinking now, uh, versus that they were thinking 5 or 10 when they originally put it up there. So the fact that it's going to be up there for 20 years doing science at that speed, it's just, it's just mind-blowing to think of what we're going to learn in the next couple of decades. Like my favorite thing about it is that we're gonna have multiple generations of discoveries. Like we're gonna discover things that we don't currently know. And then we're gonna make discoveries on top of those discoveries and then discoveries on top of those discoveries and so on and so on. And considering how long it took to get this thing up there and how many delays and how many countless ways this could have gone wrong. I don't know, I, I feel like we get so little good news anymore. It, it almost feels a little weird even trying to process this. I actually asked a question in a Patreon live stream one time. I was like, when was the last time there was an event or a big news story that was actually good news, that like everybody agreed was good, it was a good thing? Uh, you know, like news is always awful. And even the, the good news for, for most people, there's still some people that get left out of that good news and then it gets derided by somebody, you know. So, so when was the last time something happened that just everybody was on board with? It was just universally a good thing. Like, obviously that's impossible. There's always gonna be somebody that has a different opinion. But the closest that I can think of was the moon landing. You know, that, that, that I mean, and I wasn't even around for that. So, uh, you know, my point was that I couldn't imagine something that could galvanize that much positive energy ever again, especially in our divided times. And I don't know that this equals that. I don't know that this is anywhere close to the, to the moon landing or anything like that. But, but honestly, it's, it's the closest thing that I can think of.
and, and however short this might come to reaching that level, I'm pretty sure that there's something in the future of web that will be a moment like that. You know, maybe it will be finding an, an actual Earth-like planet or finding a planet with distinct biosignatures that there's no, this, there's no way around it. This, this planet has life. Maybe it's something like that that's just going to make everybody go, what? So listen, you know, we, we just we don't get much good news anymore. So let's just take this win. You know, let's just take this moment and let's really appreciate it. And, and if you have any friends that are going a little bit overboard about it, or a little bit too happy, you, you know, just, just let them have it. Just let them have it. Anyway, this is just the beginning. There is much more to come. And uh, from what it's worth from a humble YouTuber, uh, I just want to say thanks to all the people who worked on this project for the decades that this was in, in the works. Like, you guys nailed it. Th this, this, is, this is a miracle. This is, this is a science miracle that this thing actually worked and that we actually are getting this science. So, so many different ways this could have gone wrong and it didn't. This was, this was Doctor Strange seeing 14 million ways that it didn't go wrong and the one way that it went right and we actually got that. We, we just got so lucky here. And um, I'm celebrating. I hope you guys are celebrating as well. And I just can't wait to see what comes next. So I wanted to do that and share this moment with you guys. So there you go. And uh, I will leave you with that. So enjoy. Love you guys. Take care. And I'll see you next time. And go web! <laughs>